Good morning, and welcome to Kensington Unitarians. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. My name is Eleanor Chiari, and it's a great honor to have been invited to speak to you today and um, in this beautiful chapel. Thank you for making the time away from the busy bustle of your life, away from your everyday worries and urgent tasks. So let's take a few moments to settle together. If it feels comfortable, so let go of anything you don't need to be holding. And if it feels comfortable, close your eyes and rest your hand on your heart. Take a couple of breaths and ask yourself, how am I feeling right now? Don't judge, just feel. Notice any tension you're carrying in your body and breathe into it for a moment. Whatever the state of your heart, you're welcome here today exactly as you are. And when you feel ready, open your eyes and look onto the other people gathered here today and also on the screen, faces familiar and unknown, each carrying their own story of joy and pain their own unique journey to this place on this morning and welcome each other. This time is for you and for us. So just take a moment. For those who's jo who are joining us remotely, hello. You can see all the people in the chapel, hello. Hi, and we welcome you to exactly as you are. So I hope that what we build here together in word, song, and spirit, helps you come a little more alive to yourself, to reach out for the presence of what some people call God, or to find whatever it is you're seeking here. Whether you come here to reflect, to pray, for community, or just to rest, this time and this place is for you. I will now light our chalice as Unitarian congregations do across the world. May the light of this chalice reach out to those in need of new beginnings. May its flame illuminate the dark places at the threshold of grief and And may it bring hope and light to all our radiant becomings. Amen. So this, this coming Wednesday is the summer solstice when the Northern Hemisphere enjoys the longest day of the year. It is a time in which the Earth expresses its full potential. Animal cubs come out to play, plants stretch out and expand into full bloom, and we too can go out into warm late evenings to connect with our communities or the wide open sky. It is a time to express our passions and strongest feelings, and as with all seasonal changes, a time to go gently and reflect on all that came before and prepare for the darker months ahead. As a kid, I always used to get a bit depressed at the solstice because I was looking forward to the summer and then, oh no, the longest day of the year is already here and summer's not even starting. I hated that. So as much as the solstice is a time of feasting and celebration, it also contains within it the looming promise of the return of winter. For pagan people whose livelihoods and well-being depended on the sun, the solstice represented a time of joy but also of danger, a threshold time. The Romans had a wonderful god that they called upon to protect and bless these dangerous moments of transition. And this god, Janus, which is the one from which the month of January derives its name, had two faces, one on the front and one on the back of the head. And sometimes he was represented as a young man on one side and an old man on the other. And other times he was a woman on one side and a man on the other. I should say they, um, to use the non-binary pronoun. So Janus is the god of beginnings, gates, transitions, time, duality, doorways, passages, frames, and endings. 
And this god was called upon to mark the passage of time so that it could be noticed and honored. So as pagans prepared to gather to contemplate the sunlight streaming through the great stone threshold at Stonehenge, marking the end of spring and the beginning of summer, I would like us to take the opportunity this Sunday to reflect on thresholds, to look back and ahead, and to delve deeper into the meaning of change in our earthly lives. So today's service is going to be divided into three parts. So part one, at the threshold, considering where we are in this time of change, and in which you will also be invited to share of your candles of joy and concern. So it's about personal change, personal thresholds. Part two, lost words, which is about crossing the threshold. And I'll be looking at this book, Lost Words, and considering what this might teach us about approaching environmental catastrophe. <laughs> Sorry, um, I shouldn't, shouldn't laugh. <laughs> I just realized it sounds like a very dramatic and difficult topic, but it is. But I hope we'll hold each other in this. And part three, uh, into the unknown, formless and borderless dreaming. It will bring some thoughts from and for the future. So I hope that by exploring thresholds together, personal, environmental, and technological, we may be moved to consider what gifts we can bring that may help us in the urgent work of dreaming the world we need for tomorrow. So let's sing our first hymn, hymn 125 from the Purple Book, One More Step Along the World I Go. We're always taking one more step along the world and changing at every moment. But as we reach thresholds of change, the seasons, birthdays, anniversaries, whatever they are, year after year, patterns start to emerge that we can give meaning to. American writer Zora Neale Hurston wrote that there are years that ask questions and years that answer them. And I wonder if all of us, after the past three years especially, are living in a time of questions, a threshold time. I believe we are. 
Certainly, we're standing at the threshold of two revolutionary moments, an environmental reckoning upon which the survival of every living organism on this planet is resting, and a technological revolution we can only begin to fathom. So how can we, individual human beings, standing on the edge of history, even contemplate taking one step beyond these thresholds in the face of such radical change and potentially unimaginable suffering and loss? How can we move at all? The ancient Greek philosopher Heraclitus wrote that it is in changing that we find purpose. And it is also at the thresholds that we discover who we really are. If I think of my own life, the times that I have grown the most and really become myself are the threshold moments when my relationships failed, I lost my job, I fell in love, I gave birth to my children. Change, of course, is always happening. But when change becomes inevitable, when we can feel and see a distinct before and after, that is when the god Janus would have been called to bring their blessings. Thresholds mark danger and promise, hope and despair. And it is no accident that all human societies invented rituals to mark those moments of change. From birth to death, rituals help us honor and protect the thresholds we face as human beings and as collectives. Many of our institutions and our political systems at the moment feel very fragile and in need of protecting, perhaps because the world has changed so radically around them that they're becoming too small to contain it. Our communities and congregations too need care and time to heal. To be alive in a time of questions is a deeply vulnerable, frightening and exhausting experience, but we must resist the urgent desire to act too quickly. Sometimes staying in the uncomfortable space between, sitting with discomfort, with unknowing is what is needed, but we don't have to do it alone. So allow me to digress for a moment with a metaphor from the natural world. Crabs, at several points in their lives, outgrow their shells and have to wander the ocean as vulnerable, extremely edible creatures. Leaving their old shells behind, they become diaphanous soft beings that must allow time for their new shells to harden. First, they hide and take in oxygen to help them expand their muscles and gather nutrients. But then, in their soft state, they gather in large clusters together. Floating one on top of the other, they become a single entangled tower, which by its confusing mass, deters predators and protects them all. If we are to face the future and cross the dangerous thresholds ahead of us as a species, and indeed as Unitarians, we must sit together with our vulnerabilities and allow for time, this time of change to ripen and take its course. We must soften the boundaries between each other, recognizing that we belong to each other and to the natural world of which we are a part. The ritual of candles of joy and concern, which I understand you perform every week, is an exercise in sharing at the threshold of change. To come forth with a joy or a concern is about marking, celebrating, and lamenting change. In the sacred space of the candles, we pause for a moment together, vulnerable and exposed, and seek the blessing and care of our beloved community. So I invite Liz, I invite Liz Tuckwell to lead us in the ritual of candles of joy and concern. And obviously, people online are also welcome to join us. Thank you for sharing, and thank you for your silent prayers. I read you now a prayer for those gathered in worship by Barbara Piscan. And I'm sorry, I don't have the text, but consider it a prayer. In this familiar place, listen to the sounds of breathing, creaking chairs, shuffling feet, clearing throats, and sighing all around and online. Know that each breath, movement, the glance meant for you or intercepted, holds a life within it. These are signs 
that we choose to be in this company, have things to say to each other, things not yet said, but in each other's presence still, trembling behind our heart's doors. These doors closed but unlocked, each silent thing waiting on the threshold between unknowing and knowing, between being hidden and being known. Find the silence among these people and listen to it all, breathing, sighs, movement, holding back. Hear the tears that have not re yet reached their eyes. Perhaps they are your own. Hear also the laughter building deep where joy abides, despite everything. Listen, rejoice, and say, Amen. So before we can even begin to think of the environmental and technological thresholds we're already crossing, it is important to go within and honor our own personal changes. The Irish poet and theologian John O'Donohue invites us to ask ourselves at any moment, at which threshold am I now standing? At this time in my life, what am I leaving? Where am I about to enter? What is preventing me from crossing my next threshold? And what gift would enable me to do it? So I invite you now to take a few moments to ponder perhaps these questions or any question you want to ponder on. And to take a moment to like, again, let go of anything you don't need to be holding, perhaps put both your feet on the ground. And if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. I will ask these O'Donohue questions again, but again, I invite you to answer your own questions in a silent time. Um, and then I will ring a bell after three minutes of silence to let you know that the silence has come to an end. So I'll just repeat these questions. And don't worry if there are too many and you're not remembering them. Um, so at which threshold am I now standing? At this time in my life, what am I leaving? Where am I about to enter? What is preventing me from crossing my next threshold? And what gift would enable me to do it? So let's begin in just one moment. I'll, I'll, I'll ring the bell for the beginning of the minute, of the three minutes, and then we will. Give you three minutes. Maybe we won't go by a mechanical clock. I'll just start and then count three minutes.
for longing by John O'Donohue. Blessed be the longing that brought you here and quickens your soul with wonder. May you have the courage to listen to the voice of desire that disturbs you when you have settled for something safe. May you have the wisdom to enter generously into your own unease to discover the new direction your longing wants you to take. May the forms of your belonging in love, creativity, and friendship be equal to the grandeur and the call of your soul. May the one you long for long for you. May your dreams gradually reveal the destination of your desire. May a secret providence guide your thought and nurture your feeling. May your mind inhabit your life with the sureness with which your body inhabits the world. May your heart never be haunted by ghost structures of old damage. And may you come to accept your longing as divine urgency. May you know the urgency with which God longs for you. My friend Bob Janice Dillon says, that every day we are invited to fall in love with the world all over again. Every day presents us with the opportunity to start anew. Every breath marks a new day, a new year. So let's sing our second hymn, 259, from the Green Book, The Eternal Now. So part two, lost words. In a moment, I will play you a song called The Lost World, Words Blessing, which is based on a children's book written by Robert McFarlane called The Lost Words. The, books, the book was a response to the removal of words like otter, lark, wren, conquer, and catkins from the Oxford Dictionary for Children because they were not being used often enough. These lost words were replaced by more technological words as children's everyday lives have become increasingly less connected to nature. Robert McFarlane's book with its beautiful illustrations by Jackie Morris is a lyrical attempt at reconnecting children to those lost words and therefore also to the animals, plants and insects that are all around us in the UK landscape. In gold letters that form acrostic poems, the lost words become magical spells aimed at enchanting children in the present. But many of the lost words are also lost because the animals, plants, and insects they describe are on the verge of extinction in this country. 43% of bird species alone in Britain are in danger of going extinct. Every other creature in the book, and the pages alternate between the common ones and the ones who are in danger, holds us at the threshold. It mourns and honors and celebrates what we've already lost, 
but also refuses to accept erasure and creates a new way for us to move forward together. What I love about Lost Words is not just its singular beauty as a book, and I'll, I'll show you some pictures in a moment, but how in its simple eulogy to the natural world that we all belong to, it has become capacious enough to hold so much more than just the Lost Words it cites. Classical and folk music musical composers have adapted and are adapting the book to songs like the one you're going to hear. Spoken word artists have performed it all around the world and all kinds of community groups have taken up reciting it in public squares and in protest, have sewn quilts and painted their own versions of the illustrations. One generous donor ensured a copy would reach every primary school in Scotland, including those on far off islands and tiny villages. Lost Words opens the heart and a space for community and conversation because it is not afraid to name the loss we are all facing. It makes it our collective loss, but it sings it, spells it, chants it, draws it for us. So let's now listen to the song, which is it's a sort of summary of the book. And as the song goes, I will show you some of the illustrations and name some of these lost words. care my love and speak the things you see let your names take and root and thrive and grow and even as you travel far from heather crag and river may you like the little fisher set the stream alight with glitter may you enter now as otter without falter into water look to the sky with care my love and speak the things you see let your names take a root and thrive and grow and even as you journey on Past dying stars exploding Like the gilded one in flight Leave your little gifts of light And in the dead of night, my darling Find the gleaming eye of starling Like the little aviator Sing your heart to all dark matter
as we enter into this time of catastrophe, of species extinction, we must enter the world with care and let new words take and root and thrive and grow. We must recognize the change in our environment and leave our little gifts of light where we can. We must let the fern unfurl our grieving, let the heron still our breathing. We must recognize ourselves as belonging to this delicate world that is so threatened. Like the half seal and half human selkie creatures of old folk tales, we must remember our animal natures. And even as the hour grows bleaker, we must become the singer and the speaker because it is our stories, our shared imagination that are going to allow us to dream the radical new world that is begging to come into being if we are to survive. Lost by David Wagoner. Stand still. The trees ahead and bushes beside you are not lost. Wherever you are is called here and you must treat it as a powerful stranger. Must ask permission to know and be known. The forest breathes, listen, it answers. I have made this place around you. If you leave it, you may come back again, saying, here. No two trees are the same to raven. No two branches are the same to wren. If what a tree or a bush does is lost on you, you are surely lost. Stand still. The forest knows where you are. You must let it find you. So part three, into the unknown. There comes a time when thresholds are suddenly crossed for us and we find ourselves in a new landscape which is completely unknown. In recent months, much has been written and said about the open access AI chat GPT and some of you may have tried it. At University College where I teach, I'm already, um, teachers are pulling their hair out as students have already started to use it for their essays, for the computers writing their essays for them. And there's a lot of fear and catastrophic thinking about what we're going to do about it. Should we stop giving them essays? How are we gonna examine them? What are we gonna do? If you haven't heard of it, which is probably difficult, <laughs> sort of chat GPT, chat GPT. But if you haven't, chat GPT is a natural language processing tool driven by AI technology that allows you to have a human-like conversation with a chat bot. If you ask it questions, really difficult questions, it will answer in a language that sounds like a human is on the other side. One of my heroes, the poet and theologian Padre Gotuma, is fond of that line from David Wagoner's poem, which says, wherever you are is called here and you must treat it as a powerful stranger. So I asked ChatGPT to explain it, and it told me this, and these are the words of the AI. Here refers to the present moment, and treating it like a powerful stranger means that one should approach it with respect and attentiveness. It suggests that we should not take the present moment for granted, but rather view it as an opportunity to learn and grow. By treating the present moment as something new and unfamiliar, we can be more mindful and present in our experiences rather than being caught up in the past and worrying about the future. So this inanimate computer system gave me an answer that can also be an answer to our discussion about thresholds, about becoming mindful about change and the passage of time. At the threshold, we should encounter the present and the future and treat them as powerful strangers. We should be open and curious. As Padre Gotuma would say, we should say hello. Chat GPT is here, but if we move our hearts and our minds and our creativity towards it, rather than trying to resist it, we may just find wondrous answers beyond its threshold. 
in the voice of the AI, and this comes up also when we journal, when we write poetry in, in our notebooks sometimes, um, when we recite lost words or share songs and stories and sermons here, we stand at the creative edge between language and understanding, between unknowing and knowing. There's an intellectual side to it, yes, a cognitive side, but there's also something deeper. Maybe it's in the silence between the words, in the sounds that the words themselves make. Robert McFarlane calls his, his poems spells. Maybe there's an enchantment that comes from language um, that we need to listen to. So when we find words that speak to us and, and we move towards them, that is the place of the heart where transformation occurs. There's a mystery to the way in which by moving towards understanding, we also move away from self and into a space of spiritual change in which all borders dissolve. When we were listening to our candles of joy and concern, something happens to us. These words are not just personal, they become our words. And has it happened to you when words have come to you almost serendipitously and they vibrated within you even when their meaning was perhaps obscure? At these moments, we find that we are not lost, but we can intuit a place of infinite belonging, which is always there beyond the threshold of language and thought. And I think that might be God. And it's by moving towards daring to be transformed that we can experience a deeper encounter with the mystery of our lives and the beauty of our complicated and troubled world. So let's sing our third hymn, 102 from the Purple Book, May the Road Rise With You. Hi, we've got some announcements, but first, many thanks to Elena for leading our service today. Thanks to Ramona for tech hosting and Charlotte for co-hosting. Thanks to Peter for lovely music. And for those who are here in person, if you want to stay, Marianne will be serving refreshments in the hall. We have various small group activities for you to meet up. There are still spaces left for our online heart and soul Complementative spiritual gatherings Sunday or Friday at 7 p.m. And this week's theme is Becoming. 
West London Green Spirit Group are having a summer solstice gathering and a lunch at Essex Church at 12.30 on the 21st of June. Next Sunday, 25th of June, you could stay here all day if you wanted, especially if you like singing. Jane, our minister, will be back next week and our service will be on Discovering Delight. After the service, we'll have a singing class with Margaret. Then the Many Voices Singing Group have got a Pride-themed event with guest leader Katie Rose. And in the evening, there'll be an interfaith gathering of storytelling, music and art on the theme of Celebrating Life, organised by Spirit of Peace. The week after that, on Wednesday the 28th of June, Heidi is organising an outing to Tate Britain. I've also got a couple of save the dates to remind you about. As Jane mentioned last week, we set the date for induction service this autumn at 2 p.m. on Saturday, 14th October, to mark the start of the new ministry. That's a long way off, but do get it in the diary if you can. Before that, this summer, we're going to hold a special celebratory service and lunch with the dual purpose, belatedly thanking our previous minister, Sarah Tinker, for her many years of ministry with our congregation and marking her retirement as we weren't able to have a proper do at the time. We'll also be thanking Harold Lonzarelli for his contribution to five decades of church music. That end of an era service and celebration is going to take place on our usual Sunday service slot on the 23rd of July. If you're planning to come to that, could you please let Patricia know as soon as possible so we can organize the catering? Details of our various activities are on the back of the order of service and also in the Friday email. The congregation very much has a life beyond Sunday mornings. We encourage you to keep in touch, look out for each other and do what you can to nurture supportive connections. I'll hand back to Eleanor for our closing words now. So I'm going to leave you with a blessing which was created by the AI chat GPT, entirely by him, by it. Terrible, you see, it's a computer and I'm giving it a male gender. Ah, <laughs> may you find peace in the present and hope for the future. May your spirit be unbreakable and your heart be open to all. May you have the wisdom to know what you can control and what you cannot. May you find the courage to let go and to embrace the unknown. May you find beauty and growth in the journey of facing the unknown. Blessed be. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.